Hello, this is Eric Boyce, CEO and Chief Investment Officer for BKA Wealth Consulting, and welcome to Charts of the Week for October 25th of 2021. Please see our disclaimer for important information. As we get started this week, uh, we revisit our high frequency data that we get uh, courtesy of First Trust, our friends in Chicago. Uh, data on balance looks pretty good. This is the same trend that we've seen for the last couple of weeks. Uh, we did see a little bit of lull in the data uh, about a month or so ago, uh, obviously at the peak of the Delta variant. Now Delta is rolling over, as we'll see in just a second. On balance, the data, like I said, looks pretty good. TSA checkpoint data down slightly for the month. Uh, and we also have a, a slight decrease uh, continued on rail car traffic. Some of that has to do with the supply chain choke points, which are absolutely uh, relevant uh, right now uh, and uh, will be relevant as we head towards the end of the year. Obviously, the holiday shopping season uh, could be impacted. There's certainly a lot of demand. Consumers are intent on wanting to spend more money than they did even back in 2019. But the question is, are the shelves going to be empty? Uh, is there going to be product for them to buy? And, and we do know that there are supply chain choke points that still need to be worked out, driver shortages, uh, uh, container shipments uh, backlogged in uh, ports uh, waiting to be unloaded. Uh, rail car traffic is similarly impacted uh, for different dynamics. But as you see, if you back that out, a hotel occupancy only down 10% from 2019, open table down about 7.5% and TSA checkpoint data down about 22%, uh, largely because inventories have not been uh, released back into the market uh, of airplanes with capacity. Here's a quick check in on our COVID tracker. You can see the continued trend. Obviously, uh, folks are looking at uh, different uh, different variants, and you know we could see, you know, possibly the emergent, uh, emergence of a new Greek letter uh, of some type of variant. In fact, there have been several documented uh, variants and, and frankly subvariants to to Delta, that uh, none of which have posed a significant transmissible threat uh, to date. This doesn't have a title, but I pulled it off of uh, Jeffrey Kleintop's uh, thread on his Twitter feed. And this is a, a quick check in on container pricing. And, you know, he, he is, uh, you know, his comment here is that, you know, things have been worse. Uh, you can see in the orange line, that's 2020. And we knew that that was rising throughout the year and kind of we started off at a, a very, you know, a, a difficult and challenging level. And uh, so the 2020 was actually on, uh, let's see, container rate on the left axis. The right axis uh, is 2021. And what we see here is we see a little bit of leveling off. Uh, again, I, I'm not sure that that it should tell us that everything's going to get, you know, get fixed here pretty soon. But from a logistics standpoint, you, you want to, you know, you, know, you want to take every little win you can get. Right now, we, we do see the container rates dropping just a tad right now. This is uh, something uh, reprinted in Charles Schwab out of the International Monetary Fund. And, you know, the argument, uh, some arguments we've been making, you know, the relative valuation attractiveness of international markets and in particular Europe. Uh, Europe tends to work at a little bit of a lag than the U.S., and obviously we've seen a strong response in the economy and the market. Uh, this slide just indicates that what, what caught my eye here is that the, the degree to which uh, Europe is going to be very, uh, uh, very, uh, it's just the slide kind of alludes to, you know, expansionary, but it's going to be, you know, fiscal policy, uh, governments are going to be spending a lot of money to try to rebuild economies and try to bolster economies in addition to what's going on in the central bank level, and that's monetary policy. But what's really strong here is that in addition to the U.S., we're seeing a really strong response uh, over in Europe. And I do think that we're going to see some better performance out of European uh, equities uh, here in the next uh, 12, 24 months. Quick look on jobs here. We got two windows here. We got initial jobless claims. The deep blue line there that you see is 2021. You can see that continue to track. 
Again, we do have labor choke points in a lot of different areas. Uh, NFIB, we, we saw this last week in the charts of the week. The jobs are really hard to fill, and that's a big problem for small business. In fact, it's their most pressing issue right now is finding workers. But if you look on balance, even though there are more job openings for unemployed people, you do see the jobless claims number continuing to drop here. And then on the right hand side, uh, this represents continuing claims. So this is something that, you know, if you're trying to measure kind of the ongoing uh, and incremental health of the economy, this is very important. And you can see this both charts actually superimposed against prior years. And you can see the trend in continuing claims is really tracking well right now. Here's another look at labor. So this is just a plot of hours worked and hourly pay. And so, you know, in the in the gray bars, uh, you can see hourly earnings and, and the latest several data points that we've seen have clearly been above what we've uh, witnessed over, you know, frankly, a, about a 14, 15 year time frame. Uh, and, and those numbers have been pretty strong for a lot of different reasons. Uh, obviously, service industries are commanding more wages uh, because these jobs are tough to fill. Quit rate is extor extraordinarily high right now. And so wages are moving higher. Uh, and you can see too in the blue line, the average work week is moving higher too. So as uh, firms are finding it difficult to find people to work, uh, they're asking existing employees to work a little bit longer uh, to try to increase capacity that way. Uh, again, this, this has a lot of impact within the service sector, not so much in manufacturing, uh, but overall we do see wages moving higher, which it does feed into the inflationary uh, arguments that we've been making for some time. I do think this will continue to be a theme that we're gonna be talking about uh, certainly transitioning into 2022 uh, and will be an input into the inflation number that we see. But at the same time, it does put more money into consumer pockets and to the extent that, you know, overall goods uh, and services inflation, uh, you know, is, is able to stay below the rate of hourly earnings. Right now it's not, but if it is, uh, then, then that's a net benefit to consumers. All right, housing market. Now we've talked about housing market off and on, uh, builder sentiments, it's still reasonably uh, well. Existing home sales uh, off a little bit. There is some seasonal factors at play. You can see that as this deep blue line is kind of superimposed against the prior years. So there's, there's definitely a seasonal impact here, but we are still tracking above where we were. Now, if you look at homes, uh, months of supply, uh, still very, very, very low. Uh, and again, the red line that sits just above the, the deep blue line there is 2020. And we knew that we already know that that was a very outlier year, uh, as you can certainly see here, relative to the uh, prior uh, uh, six, six, seven years. But uh, inventories are low, uh, home sales continue to track higher, uh, home prices, uh, maybe not growing at the rate of gain that we saw earlier this year, but still growing. Weekly consumer uh, comfort index. Now this is not consumer sentiment. Uh, it's not consumer confidence. These are different types of surveys. Uh, this is, just happens to be the one that I caught this week. Uh, not surprisingly, it, it has rolled over. I mean, the latest uh, is uh, 49 uh, uh, here. And, and so it sits, really below a 50% uh, level. This is a diffusion index. So comfort is moving a little bit lower. Uh, as we see, it, again, it's not catastrophic. It's certainly not where it was in the pandemic, uh, but you can see the rate of gain from that uh, trough has been relatively strong. And so, you know, I think in some respects, this has to do with maybe the Delta at a lag, because this data does come to us at a lag. Uh, it has a lot to do with kind of like mean reversion back to a level that may be lower than where it was pre-pandemic. Uh, but we do know that consumers are, uh, are spending a lot of money uh, if they can get their hands on goods. Uh, we know that their intentions on spending money are improving. And right now wages are moving higher uh, in, in response to perhaps offsetting some of the other uh, inflation in there. But, uh, but right now we just have seen a little bit of a lull in consumer comfort uh, and uh, we'll be looking for that uptick or at least the, the bottoming out and settling out here pretty soon. 
You know, as we talk about inflationary pressures, now this is something that really caught my eye from uh, B of A, uh, Bank of America Global Research, and this is a study on a year-over-year -year basis, raw material costs uh, for the average vehicle. This is a poll of, of uh, actually it's not a poll, it's, it's, it's from their research department, from their kind of mosaic as they've reached out and done research on the automotive industry and look, looked at manufacturers. What we see here is that we've seen a massive increase in raw material costs per vehicle, uh, really ever since like May 2020. So like essentially not too long after the pandemic hit us and we have the shutdowns, did we start to see uh, this increase in vehicle cost? Uh, and, and it's real, you know, you can see that this is somewhat cyclical. We've seen increases before, but not to this magnitude here. And so what we want to do, obviously, for the health of that industry the, and, and uh, obviously the health of the consumer, because this is a large ticket item for most people, is you want to see that roll over. Uh, and so we'll definitely be monitoring this, but I thought it was interesting to share today. All right, inflation on various aspects of it. This is uh, Statista, and uh, and this is a, a kind of a look at different categories, and uh, particularly you know used cars and trucks we know about uh, that's been high. But if you get down to the food basket, uh, this is something that most people you know are definitely seeing at the supermarket uh, these days, and these numbers are not. Um, uh, are not insignificant. I mean, even at Apple's an 8% increase. I mean, that's obviously a, a head of inflation, uh, but then you get into bacon, steaks, uh, eggs, and these types of categories, uh, and they're tracking well, well above uh, where they were a year ago. This is, this is data going back to looking at year-over-year -year data last uh, September, last month. All right. Now we have uh, expectations uh, for inflation or headline inflation above 3%. Now we know it is already above 3% now, but what are the expectations? And, and we saw this um, in some of the data that I was looking at for market minutes uh, last week. And right now the uh, median inflation expectation for three years is 4.2%. And it's a slight increase. Uh, versus uh, really just a handful of weeks ago. And so this breaks down what that expectation is for above 3% inflation over two years, five years, 10 and 30 years. Now, I, I wouldn't get too carried away uh, with the 30 and in many respects, even the 10, but the two and the five are important. Um, so this is a, a an implied probability of what, uh, of, of how, likely it is to have above 3% inflation over the over these time frames and you know if you, you look at 2% the implied probability excuse me 2 years the implied probability is 73% and the implied probability of above 3% inflation over 5 years is really right at 50% so uh, there's a higher confidence level of near term inflation not necessarily being transitory elements of it yes uh, but overall rates uh, being above 3%. Um, now, I, I've been on record quite clearly as saying that the inflation that we're seeing today, um, you know, producer price inflation is like 8%, consumer is over 5, 5.4. That is going to roll over. We're not going to see that into perpetuity. That's just not, that's not sustainable. You'll crush an economy that way. Prices for some of these uh, commodities, which we'll see in a second, you know, will ultimately come down. But I think the likelihood of a 3% or 3.2, which if you go back over literally 80, 90 years is an average inflation rate. So we can live with 3% uh, if the implied probability suggests that it's more likely than not, I can live with that. You know, that, it, 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 that to me, you obviously have to have inflation to have stagflation or stagnant growth with inflation. Uh, and people are arguing about that. We've got a slide coming up in the deck uh, towards the end, kind of what areas of the market uh, tend to work well in a stagflationary environment. I don't necessarily see stagflation on the margin right now unless uh, we have a material decline uh, in growth uh, which we can't build ourselves back out of. But right now, implied probabilities suggest 
a little bit higher inflation, uh, certainly than we've been used to uh, over the next two and five year periods. As a response to inflation, we do see shorter term yields move higher. Now this is, you know, the two year is, is at a point on the yield curve uh, that, you know, the Fed isn't manipulating uh, nearly as much. Obviously they hold their target for short term rates at or near zero right now. We know that, uh, you know, that there's conversations about tapering or curtailing their asset purchases. And that's step one for the Federal Reserve in their attempts to kind of normalize monetary policy. Step two would obviously for them be to raise short term interest rates. Well, here the market uh, in the two year note uh, is already doing that work for them. So they're already assuming that uh, rates are moving higher in response to inflation. The only question is really, you know, when do when does the Fed raise rates? You know, when do we see a more normalized curve? Uh, and right now we've, we've seen most of this action between the two and the 10 year note. And this just happens to be the two year uh, government bond yield uh, moving higher. Uh, you can see that, you know, we did see that fairly high last um, April and uh, it's moving back up to those levels right now. Here is the 10 year treasury note yield. We've seen a lot of action in this. Um, we've seen some curious action, uh, even in August with the yield moving lower, uh, it, 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 despite higher inflation prints. Uh, the 10 year usually uh, re kind of reflects that inflation expectation. And at the time in July, August, you know, the consensus was overwhelmingly that all of this inflation was transitory. I didn't believe it. And I've said that in these broadcasts that I didn't at the time believe it was trend as transitory as people were making it out to be. Well, I think that's coming to fruition. And you can see in response to that 10 year note yields uh, are moving a little bit higher. They uh, they did have a breakout, uh, as this chart indicates, uh, earlier this month uh, and, and kind of late last month and into early this month. And we see those uh, numbers moving higher uh, on yield. So this is uh, getting back to what uh, the expectations are for the Fed. So you know, we, uh, we've already heard in the uh, Fed announcements and the minutes that they're talking about when to curtail their asset purchases. I know that's kind of an abstract thing for a lot of people to kind of get your arms around. Uh, but as I said before, that's step one. Step two is to actually raise short term interest rates. And so, you know, there, there's two different views of this. There's an implied Fed funds rate level. You know, you, you, you look at this, you know, there, there's uh, in the market, you can look at different instruments, you can look at you know, spreads and you can come up with an implied uh, set of changes. And so that in looking at the market, looking at the data in the market, it, it, it's, uh, it implies that we're going to have two um, uh, rate increases, one kind of late summer next year, that August 20, 2022, and then later on in the year, December 2022. Uh, and, and then if you actually poll um, traders, poll investors, you know, and these are institutional investors. On the right hand side, they're actually the probability of three Fed rate hikes by the end of next year is actually about 70 to 75 uh, percent. So very interesting. So the very clear consensus that rates are moving higher next year. All right. So with that, with rates moving higher, uh, that doesn't imply a really uh, strong environment for bonds on balance, you know, because uh, the, there's an inverse relationship when rates move higher, uh, prices go lower uh, and vice versa. And so with rates moving higher, uh, we, there's a very dire or maybe not dire, but dour outlook on bonds, um, you know, looking at over the next uh, 12 months. And so this is a survey of global fund managers as reported in Bank of America's research. And, you know, they're about as pessimistic on uh, bonds overall as we've ever seen in the, in the series, uh, in the time series of this particular survey. Uh, you can see that there have been points in time in 2007, 2011, 13, and 18 
where we had troughs and optimism, but this really eclipses all of that. And it really has to do with this kind of this firming notion that, all right, maybe we have finally seen this inflation that's going to break out and it's going to cause prompt the end of the secular bull market uh, in rates that we've seen that, you know, that the age of uh, bond yields that we saw over the last two years is, is over. That seems to be, you know, that whole sentiment seems to be shifting and it's led to this increase in pessimism. So as we look at, um, as we look at, um, uh, the, the rate market, uh, and, and this it gives like, you know, Bloomberg Global Aggregate. So this is the Barclays has an aggregate index for bonds, which is kind of all encompassing. Bloomberg has the same thing. And so this is looking at Bloomberg's index. And so, uh, and it's looking at annual uh, performance uh, numbers uh, over many different years, kind of tracking throughout the year. And so as we've seen yields move higher, you see that little dotted circle there at the lower right. That is where we are today. And so we're on pace for probably one of the worst bond uh, performance years that we've seen in a while. And this is for that aggregate index. But as you'll see in a second, some areas of market are, or of the bond market in particular are actually doing really well this year. A high yield is doing phenomenal. Uh, because we have an expanding economy and uh, credit spreads are really, really low. But just suffice it to say that, you know, this is on kind of on par with what we saw in 2018, which is a, a pretty, you know, bad market year. So, you know, this is price. This is this is total performance. So what you're doing is you're 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 taking your yield, but then you're subtracting what happens to prices and the, the net of those two things is putting us down, you know, around negative four to five percent so far uh, for the year in this particular index. So as I was saying about high yield, uh, you know, it's really an outlier. So, I mean, we've seen other areas of the market, you know, certainly, uh, you know, in, in the more stressed uh, credit layers, you know, if you think of AAA being the most secure, um, very few uh, issuances have that. But if you get into like marginally investment grade, you know, like you know, triple B, triple B minus, um, and the distressed market as a percent of the aggregate high yield market uh, has actually remained somewhat steady. But you can see in the in the gray shaded areas, the distressed as a percent of high yield par outstanding uh, has really gone down. And we've seen an improvement in credit quality, even amongst these lower tiers where we're not experiencing default rates. Now we'll transition into uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, we've seen a massive uh, response uh, year to date in Bitcoin. Uh, we're seeing the first kind of publicly traded uh, crypto ETF. Uh, we're beginning to see some approvals at the regulatory level for some of these types of products. And um, I just I thought I'd show this chart that caught, kind of caught my eye from the daily shot. And it, and it shows you kind of this the fear and greed index. And right now it's an extreme greed. There's a lot of interest here. Obviously, there have been a lot of people that have done well in crypto. Uh, it's extremely volatile. Um, and I'm beginning to kind of report the monthly and the year-to-date performance numbers in my uh, market minute segment uh, for Bitcoin. But right now, it, Bitcoin is in an extreme greed position. And if, there anybody, if there's anybody out there interested in playing it, it probably behooves you to wait for a better entry point. All right, well, we'll talk about commodities here for a second. This is a uh, kind of an all-encompassing chart of uh, all the you know, a lot of the different types of commodities, soft commodities, agricultural, uh, you've got gold in here and uh, you've got crude oil and some of those industrial commodities as well. And you can see that on balance, you know, we've had mo the majority uh, of the commodity basket do, do well. And we know commodities on balance have done exceptionally well this year. Uh, and you know, glad that we have an allocation in our portfolios to the commodity basket. But some of the better performing ones we know, crude, gasoline, um, natural gas uh, has not been necessarily for the month, but for the year, natural gas is up tremendously. 
Uh, but you can see, you know, sugar, cocoa, soybeans, um, and corn have not performed well, at least over the last month. But then other areas like platinum, silver, industrial metals, uh, crude oil uh, has done exceptionally well. Now, as we kind of you know, kind of talk about the equity markets, uh, you know, this is something that we show from time to time that it really is is pretty phenomenal here, and and you know it's it's just the oddity of it all that just kind of gets me here. This is the volatility index or the VIX, so it's 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 essentially a, a proxy for how volatile the market is. And ironically, we're seeing a really really low level. It's not necessarily the all time level. Uh, this is kind of showing you a time series that more or less goes back about a year and a half. And, and you know, we've had this continued decline in volatility with spikes, of course. But right now we're at a really low point in volatility, uh, which, you know, if you turn that on its head, it implies that uh, investors are extremely complacent despite the potential for inflationary uh, pressures uh, and such. So while we're talking about low volatility, it's also important to talk about breadth in the market. And um, so there have been points in time where we've seen uh, significant participation across the entire index in the index move. And right now uh, we don't have as much. So we, essentially we're about 60% of the S&P is above its 50 day moving average, even as we're kind of approaching these all time highs. And so what's happening here uh, lately, at least, uh, you know, you can see here that 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 percentage has kind of moved up uh, from the 35 to 40 range really over the last month. Um, but uh, by and large, a lot of the price movement has been uh, over the last certainly over the last couple of weeks from technology stocks and in almost uh, low quality, non profitable uh, companies and especially non profitable tech companies have really led this market kind of incrementally higher here over the last several weeks. Uh, and, um, you know, the 60% line is kind of a, a kind of a line of best fit across this time series uh, going back to the beginning of last year. Uh, but, you know, good news is that we're having increasing uh, contribution uh, across the entire uh, constituency of the index. Uh, it's just not as, as high as it's been lately. And looking at fund manager surveys is really insightful to me. And, um, and, and I always kind of like to dovetail it against my own thinking. And, and this is kind of actually it, it, it does dovetail quite nicely with um, with how I feel. So uh, this is kind of an incremental month to month uh, look October and September. Uh, this is, again, the Bank of America Global Fund Manager Survey. I might recategorize a couple of these things if I was filling this out. Uh, but uh, certainly long uh, technology stocks, I do feel like that is a pretty crowded trade. Uh, Bitcoin, I might rank a little bit higher. Uh, and, um, and then oil is a pretty long trade. But there are definitely some uh, inputs uh, into why oil is higher. Uh, you know, we don't have a capacity response yet to the demand, and we are expecting incremental demand in this reopening, and not just in the U.S., but global. Uh, as well. But um, anyway, so you can see here that uh, the technology is clearly viewed as a crowded trade right now. And so as we uh, get closer to the end of our conversation here, uh, you know, this is something I mentioned a little bit uh, earlier, but you know, if we were to enter a period of stagflation, again, it's extremely rare, you know, we had uh, in, in the late, mid to late 70s, we had a period of stagflation, uh, high inflation, kind of low, low to, you know, very benign growth. And, you know, these are the areas that responded well to that time frame. So you got uh, real estate, uh, kind of a quote unquote scarce resource, but ironically, travel and leisure uh, performed well. And uh, so, you know, you can see these areas, you know, financials, energies, uh, insurance utilities uh, tended to perform well. You had yield uh, that that uh, that did reasonably well in that environment. Uh, industrial goods, 
uh, did very well. But on the flip side, you can see over there technology, which has been kind of this bell cow of sorts for the market over the last several years. And certainly, a, you know, last a year ago, last summer, when this market kind of uh, took off like a rocket ship after the pandemic, you know, technology is at the other end of the scale. So as, if we're looking ahead and kind of trying to uh, game this, uh, and you know, do our Monte Carlo simulations and say, well, you know, what are the range of outcomes over the next couple of years? And I mean, if stagflation is in that calculus, if it's it, you know, if you feel like you know that there's a reasonably uh, you know decent shot of having stagflation, then you would not want to own technology uh, in 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 great numbers. But uh, again, I would be on record as saying that uh, I think. There would have to be some policy mistakes uh, that would have to feed into this uh, stagflation uh, thesis. Uh, right now, I, I just don't see it. I can see lower growth uh, with inflation moderating from current levels, and you 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 just essentially have kind of a a lower growth mode. But I don't think you get actual stagflation out of it. All right, household income. I, I thought this was really interesting. This time series goes back to really just the advent of the pandemic. And on the left-hand side, you can see the composition of what those income changes look like. And that orange block are, are, represents stimulus payments. And so we know that we had several rounds of that. And you can see how that influenced overall income growth. But as you, as you transition from left to right in that light blue area where income from wages and other private sources was a net drag during the pandemic, it's been very consistently positive. And so that's a very healthy sign for income growth is that you're getting it from wages. Uh, you're not getting it from stimulus, which is good. We know that's gone away. Uh, now you do have state unemployment benefits that are still relevant in this equation. But again, the overall incomes are going up uh, for a lot of different reasons. And one of those reasons uh, is certainly uh, income from wages and other private sources. And we wanna continue to see that move higher. Now on the right-hand side, this is from uh, Bloomberg, uh, from data from the Federal Reserve. What's really interesting here is you go back to the first quarter of 2020, like pandemic ground zero, if you will. Uh, you know, and you look at the blue space, which represents a generation X folks. Um, now you can see that, you know, in, in uh, both the baby boomer uh, uh, aggregate net worth increased tremendously if you move that forward from 2020 of the first quarter into the second quarter of 2021. So basically about 15 months, you saw a really tremendous uh, growth rate in, in both baby boomers and Generation X. Uh, and, and we know most and you can see here that the, 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 the really the lion's share or the biggest cohort, or I guess the cohort that has the most relevance in terms of overall control of overall net worth in our country is the baby boomer uh, uh, age group. But uh, Generation Xers are becoming much more important. And you can see that their household net worth jumped 50% uh, in those 15 months. Really interesting data. Thought I'd uh, take a quick look at uh, uh, net interest payments as a share of GDP. So this is essentially the U.S. federal budget, and you know we've we've long benefited from low rates. So as we're issuing new debt at these low rates, um, we know that uh, it's it's obviously less of a drag on our fiscal uh, budget, uh, or at least you know our continuing resolutions. Uh, so what the government has to pay out has been lower even though we've been increasing debt. Now the risk is that as interest rates move higher that you know that the government share of budget coming from interest payments is going to increase. And this is a study from the CBO uh, essentially drawing out to like the next 10 years. And, and you can see here clearly that you know as a percent of GDP, interest payments are moving higher over that time frame. And it and as it does, it's going to inherently put a little bit more pinch on what the government can spend uh, otherwise. And you know, it, it puts more pressure on your taxing re regime. You know, a lot of conversation right now about increasing taxes, especially on higher income earners. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, and if you're raising taxes to pay interest, uh, because interest burden is moving higher, you know, that's not necessarily a good thing uh, because you're not uh, you're, you're not reinvesting those incremental tax dollars into infrastructure, et cetera. Uh, so this is something that we're going to have to wrestle with as interest rates move higher and as you know, shorter term maturities of treasuries roll off and the government's having to you know, re, uh, refund those, if you will, with uh, longer maturities at higher interest rates. And a lot of conversation lately about electric vehicle sales and ESG and environmentally, you know, conscious, um, you know, investments. And, um, and, and I found this uh, in some research, which was really interesting. Uh, now, I don't know Regal Funds Management, but uh, they're getting this data from Morgan Stanley and some other sources. But, you know, it, it's just interesting to watch. Uh, they're looking at, you know, between 2022 and 2039, uh, so, you know, the better part of the next 20 years, a 17% compound annual growth rate in electronic vehicles. And then, then it begins to kind of, uh, then you get to a more normalized 2% uh, growth rate. But right now, you know, what this kind of shows and kind of implies is that we are literally on the cusp of an explosion uh, in electric vehicle sales. And then all of those derivative uh, industries that feed into that, batteries and so on and so forth, charging stations, infrastructure, uh, you name it. Well, that will do it for the broadcast this week. Hope you've enjoyed this on behalf of the entire team at BK Wealth. I uh, hope you have a wonderful week, a safe week, and look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care. Goodbye.